This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to episode one of Things Police See, First Hand Accounts. In this episode, I interview retired Pomona officer Rob McCreary. Rob had an incredible career in Pomona. He saw so many crazy, just out of this world things, you won't believe it. I mean, from shooting it out with gangsters in the street to wrestling people on PCP. This guy has done everything. He's had some crazy times as a cop, and I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. I really enjoyed interviewing Rob. He's just such a great guy, and um, the interview just really shows you what it takes to be a police officer in Southern California right now, how crazy it can be, and and how it affects your life afterwards, how what it does to your to your mind, and just kind of how you relate to everybody else in society. So it's just a great episode. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you again for uh, checking it out. And here it is, my interview with Rob McCreary. I'm here with Rob McCreary. He was a police officer for the city of Pomona for 25 years. And um, Rob, the only thing I really know about Pomona is that when I moved here a year ago, every time I saw an apartment available, you guys told me not to move to Pomona. That is true. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough town. It's a very busy uh, bedroom community. Okay. There's a lot of... A lot of things going on in the houses and neighborhoods. It has a very high uh, crime rate for the area. If you look at the city surrounding it, um, it's kind of like the drain of the area. Everything just kind of falls into Pomona. So I'm because of this, I'm particularly excited to talk to you about your experience being a police officer there because I know you have some great, uh, some great stories. Can you can you describe to everyone what what it was like and what was going through your head? And what was the the first like hot call call that you would consider like a real hot call that you ever responded to? And it, when you went there, you were like, "Oh my god!" I believe it was probably 1993. Uh, I was off training, not even a year. I was assigned to B Squad, which is uh, day shift, working Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, me and this guy that I uh, ended up becoming good friends and partners with we were dispatched to a possible man with a gun call which that kind of call is pretty common in Pomona because we have a lot of gangs okay so your your litmus test for a hot call might be different than someone like me who worked for a very small town right we're, we're used to victims of a shooting almost daily right or shots fired pretty much daily okay um yeah pretty violent town Okay, so you, you, you get dispatched to this call. Yes, uh, it was up in the islands, which is the north side of uh, Pomona, which is uh, controlled by back then. It still kind of is today, but it's a gang. It's a blood gang, uh, African-American gang. They call themselves the 456 Island Bloods. So this particular individual that we came across, uh, his drug of choice was PCP. Wonderful. So this, I had kind of, as on training, come across PCP a little bit, but this was going to be my first welcome to PCP kind of call. As an East Coaster, these PCP calls were heard on the East Coast, but it was specific to California. Like, we heard a lot of PCP yes, over here. Yes, yes. It, it, with, the, with the black gangs back in the 80s and in the 90s, it was still... It was still very, it was mostly with the OGs too. And this guy, um, his name was Andre Swafford. He was a OG blood gangster, always, always on PCP, in and out of prison. Oh, jeez. So he was walking around the, the neighborhood uh, acting strange, taking off his clothes. Um, and he had, uh, they saw him with a revolver in his waistband, but he wasn't brandishing it at that time. So we get called, and my partner and I roll up. We're in one-man cars, but we're following each other to the call. We see Andre, and he immediately takes off running. So he he runs south uh, through a backyard, and then we enter the backyard, and he's trying to get over a chain-link fence, but he's really dusted. So he's having Great. some problems. So you can only imagine you're... You're running to grab a guy who's known to be behind PCP all the time and has a gun. 
Yeah. So <laughs> wow. what he did was he uh, when he got to the fence, he saw us coming. He throws the gun over the fence into the alley. Uh, he turns around, and now I notice that he's really sweaty. I don't remember what time of year this was, but I just remember he was super sweaty, and he has no shirt on. So he starts running directly at my partner, uh, Officer Lanier, and they start fighting. And and Mondo, Mondo Lanier was the partner I worked with. Mondo back then was in really good shape. He was probably about six feet tall, 210 pounds, worked out a lot. And me back then, I was six feet two, about 150 pounds, soaking wet with sand in my pockets. Not quite physically fit, but, you know, I could run. So this guy starts fighting, and I see him grab Mondo by the neck and lift him up and put him into a chain link fence. Oh, man. So I run over there and kick this man in the balls as hard as I can, <laughs> and it doesn't even phase him. That he, alone is terrifying. He turns around, and he starts running again, starts jumping fences. Now we're three or four houses away from when we first started, and I'm already exhausted, completely exhausted, and we're putting out a call, you know, a 906 call, which means in Pomona, 906 means we need help like yesterday. Okay. So we make it into this garage of this house where the guy is, uh, the garage door faces the alley, which would be south. So he's inside the open garage, and he's punching through a, a pane, pane, or uh, what's that? The window, yeah, uh, window pane. He's just literally punching through this. He's knocking out supports and everything. Just he was just not feeling anything. So he goes through the window into the front yard. I run around the side and I try to tackle this guy. And then we're fighting and I'm hitting this guy. I'm kicking him. I'm doing everything I can and nothing is facing. Probably with him. everything you got, it's just not. So I finally pull out my gun because I'm so tired. And I have my gun at my side in my right hand. I try to pull it up to his head, and he grabs the barrel. And he's just looking at me. And he's literally in the process of taking my gun from me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to die right now. Oh, man. So then out of nowhere, Mondo comes through the broken window from the garage with a flathead shovel and proceeds to hit Andre on the top of the head as hard as he could. And it dropped him like a sack of shit. Oh my I'll, just, nev I'll never forget the sound it made when he hit him on the head with that shovel. <laughs> oh, my God. It worked. Just sustain that. He, he, no, he went to the ground. He, was, he wasn't unconscious, but he knocked him down, got him off me. Um, he was trying to get up, but Mondo just kept ripping him in the head with his shovel. And I just remember how tired I was at that point. It Exhausted. was just crazy. Yeah. And so then finally other units start getting there. And it took probably another four or five of us to get him handcuffed. My God, what a drug. Yeah, it's, it, and that's not his only encounter with us that he's had like that. He's had about three or four 906 calls with uh, just Pomona. There's nothing, nothing worse than getting out of breath and like exhausted. Yeah, when you're just out of gas and you realize that you're about to lose your firearm, yeah, that's, that's bad. I ended up having a couple broken fingers. Um, Mondo, I think had some something wrong with his throat from when the guy was choking the shit out of him up against the fence but other than that the bad guy had a he had some serious injuries too um he went to jail uh for a couple more years for assault on us and uh long story short a couple of years after or right before i retired um he ended up committing a homicide killed his his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend just basically assassinated him and He's back in the. You prison. guys are just waiting for this guy to kill someone, right? I mean, oh yeah, this is going to happen. He well, he had he'd already gotten away with several shootings, you know, gang related stuff. But right, the uh, the last homicide he did and his ex girlfriend's new boyfriend, there was you know four or five witnesses, broad daylight, just totally assassinated the guy. Wow. So after you after you get done wrestling with him and you guys, you have him buckled up in the cruiser, like what do you? <laughs> Where was your mind frame after that? That was the first time you ever saw this. You did this job, and you were like, wow. That was the first time I thought that you could really die doing this job. Right. I mean, you really, you, you know it. You, they tell you that, and you see it. You but hear you're about young. It. You're, you're but strong. But I, I just never, I don't think it never really imprinted on my brain until that incident. And I realized, man, i got to start working out. Yeah. That was, that was not cool. 
Wow. That's incredible. Rob, can you tell me about the most bizarre or strangest? I'm sure you have a bunch of them, but just a bizarre or strange call that you went to. Well, I wish I could remember. There's so many more details about this call. I can't remember, but I do remember the the basics. And again, this is like right around the same time I was a new guy on day shift working that uh, that weekend day shift. And I was working over on the east side of town, and I get called. They dispatch me and uh, a backup call and a supervisor. And they also said, hey, animal control is coming. And they said, 927 Holt in San Antonio. 927 means check the vicinity for a lion. Like a mountain lion? No, they said it was an African lion, like a full-grown <laughs> oh king of the God. jungle African lion. Now, I don't live near the jungle. This city is not near the jungle. Uh, so this was this was odd. So I needed a little more clarification. Um, so I do remember asking the dispatchers on a, you know, to go to Channel Two, and, and they were dead serious. They said basically this guy uh, who was transporting some wild exotic animals decided to stop by his parents house in Pomona and as he did he parked his truck in front of the house and somehow this full adult male lion escaped from the back of his cargo truck and was last seen walking towards 7-eleven at Holt in San Antonio (laughs) so this guy obviously knows Pomona probably grew up there and he yeah his, his mom lives on Mountain View just north of Holt and he thought it was a good idea to stop by with all of his, ex- his exotic animals. That he was <laughs> illegally transporting. Of course. Yeah. So here we are. You know, this call is now everybody's heard this call go out. And so everybody's in the area. And, and sure enough, walking down Holt with all the hookers and the drug addicts and everybody else is this full-grown mountain lion. Or uh, African lion. Like a full, you know, king of the jungle. Were the junkies looking at it like everybody they, was? They just, thought it was in their mind, or did they, they know just, it was real? They were, they were just tripping. Everybody <laughs> was just tripping out. People were running. People were screaming. We're getting all kinds of calls, and uh, it ended up going over by uh, the park. There's a park right there, about a block away, and it went into the park. It kind of sat down on the grass. Looked like he was enjoying himself. Not a worry. In but the world. I was thinking, I don't know what to do here. You know, I don't. I don't think we can shoot it. I don't really want to shoot the lion. Right. So they were telling us to just try to keep an eye on it, and they had uh, wildlife people from the forestry, I guess the forestry department, some park rangers or something, who had uh, weapons to deal with this thing. Right, probably game wardens or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. So it took them, God, at least a half an hour. So we were following this lion all over the place over on the east side of town, trying to keep people away from it. It didn't really seem like it was being aggressive. It looked like it was confused. Kind of loping around. Yeah, just like... And then the guy, the driver said that all the animals had been uh, given drugs for the ride. Oh, that makes so sense. So he wasn't wasn't really being aggressive, but it was just the craziest thing I'd ever seen. Were you were you even confident that you could, like, stop the thing? No, no. I, and I remember I, I was... I got probably the closest to it than the other units, but I, I wouldn't, I don't want to get out of my car. I, cause I, I don't know much about lions. I just <laughs> yeah. thought, fuck, that thing can kill me if it wants. <laughs> yeah, you they're know? like 600 pounds. I have a shotgun, but you know, I don't really want to shoot this thing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking, how the hell is he ended up in Pomona? Why is he here? <laughs> right. I don't even know where he was coming from. Damn. So ultimately the, the warden guy gets there. They shoot it with, uh, some darts or something. Thing passes out. They ended up loading it up. They took custody of that animal, and I guess there was a couple other exotic creatures in the guy's truck. They ended up sighting him. Uh, the animals weren't stolen, but he didn't have the right paperwork, the right equipment. Naturally. Yeah. So that was a trip. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I'll never forget that one. That's nuts. Rob, can you tell everyone the um, the most intense? and or terrifying call that you were one of them that you were involved in okay so fast forward to 1996 about or 90 yeah right around 96 i was working of all with all people mondo Lanier again two-man car uh working swing shift 
And this particular shift, there was, uh, we were on F squad. So each squad has about seven guys on it, plus a sergeant and a corporal. Well, right out of the gate on this particular day, one of our guys from our squad was down on the south end, and he just happened to be standing in the backside of In-N-Out Burger, which backs up to this neighborhood. Well, the street you can access, like through the neighborhood, also through the, the, the main thoroughfare, which is Gary. Well, while he's standing there, a drive-by shooting is occurring in the street. So there's these gang members um, shooting at a moving vehicle on the street behind in and out and they're using like uh, Tech 9s and I think an Uzi. Oh, so they're lighting this truck up there and they ended up killing the guy. Well, Brian Bozarth, um, he grabs a shotgun out of his unit, runs over to the backside of in and out sees the suspects trying to run away, so he starts shooting at him. Wow. So we have an officer involved shooting going on in the south end of town right out of briefing. So that was that was crazy. So yeah. Fast forward a couple hours into the night, and it was a real cold night. Working a two-man car in the south, south beat five, south, uh, southwest Pomona, and we kept hearing shots like in the distant, you know, like distinct. They're very, they're like moving around, but we could hear them every few minutes. We hear pow, pow, and so we we get dispatched to a suspicious search call over in the 1,000 block of West Eighth Street. And this is a uh, duplex. It's a two-story duplex. The lady calls police and says, there's a, somebody on my front porch. I don't know who it is. I can't really see him. It's dark. But I can hear like a weird clicking noise. Like he's, he looks like he's seated on my porch and he's making this weird clicking noise. So we're thinking, maybe it's related to the shooting, the shots fired call. We're not sure. Right. So we roll down the street. And I remember as soon as we were getting closer to the house, I just had this, like, voices in my head. I always have these little voices. It's like, you need to get out of the car. And I don't know why. I just felt like we had to get out of the car. Felt like a sitting duck. Yeah. So me and Mondo get out. We start making our approach on foot. And we had to go down this really long driveway to get to the back. And then we make a sharp right turn. And it's a little parking lot. There was a Volkswagen bug parked right next to the front part of the complex and then looking north it's a it's a stairwell up to the landing where this lady lives so her house is above her garage so we see this guy really dark i hit him with my flashlight he's wearing like a black leather trench coat he looks like he might be f or drunk or maybe under the influence right so then uh, I shot my light, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? You know, you, let me see your hands. And the guy just looks at me, and he's got this, like, just crazy look in his eyes. He doesn't say a word. And he comes up with his right hand with a 6-inch 357. It's a hot round. And bow, he starts let, letting them loose. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I didn't even have a chance to pull my gun out or anything. Wow. So I just remember hitting the deck. Mondo retreated back to the driveway, the corner, but I was stuck behind this front tire of this Volkswagen. So the bad guy, he didn't, obviously he missed me because I was still alive. So I pull my gun. I start laying down rounds up at the, uh, where I last saw him. And it's so dark that I'm basically shooting at muzzle flash. So whatever your gun lights up the night. Yeah. And his, where I can see him. Okay. So this goes on. It's like a terrifying forever. strobe light. Yeah, forever. I'm shooting. I'm shooting, and I realize at at one point it looked like I may have hit him a couple times because he's rolled he's rolled over on his side, and it looks like he's like maybe trying to do a reload or something. So I'm thinking I'm in a bad spot because Volkswagen. There's no engine in the front. Right. Yeah. 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 So I think in my mind, I think I'm gonna run to the garage that's open underneath him, then he won't be able to shoot at me. Right. And that seemed like a really good idea at the time. So I, I see the bad guy still doing what he's doing. I can't see Mondo, so I make a break for it. And probably like three steps into it, he starts coming back around. So I don't know what to do, so I just run up the stairs right at him, and I just put in a magazine, and I put the whole thing into him. 13 wow. rounds. 
And then my slide lock's back, and he's still alive because I'm looking at him. <laughs> and I just I like screamed, ah, oh, my God. So I jump off the side of the stairs into the grass. I roll, hit a fence, run back to the VW, and reload. Oh, my God. Yeah, so Mondo starts shooting from the back side of the car. I crawl back to where he's at. Bad guy goes down, and now we're just kind of at a standstill. Wow. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, so I ended up firing a total of 27 rounds. I did two reloads, and I don't remember any of them. I bet. Um, and it ended up, after everybody got there, we used a dog to bring him down. Yeah. Uh, he was still alive. How many times was he shot? 15. Wow. What were you guys carrying for a caliber? 45 caliber oh my with goodness. black talon rounds. You can't get any better stopping power than that. Yeah. He was and on PCP? He was. He was a Southside Village Crip, just got paroled. Um, wasn't a real big uh, family guy. His family didn't even try to sue. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he ended up, I think he was pretty much dead at the at the point. They brought him down the stairs, but they transed him, got him to the hospital. <laughs> and the doctor was just amazed at how many holes he had. And like, why did you bring me this? Yeah. You know, there's not much I can do here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But I ended up losing a lot of hearing because the backside was uh, the front complex of this. It was stucco. Mm -hmm. And then I was surrounded by a block wall and then another building. So I just remember each round was just so loud. It was like cannon fire. The you 357 know, Magnum is so loud anyway. I mean, when but every round I fired even was loud. Okay. So I could not hear anything. I had oh. ringing in my ear for probably three weeks. You still, do you get tinnitus still? Like yeah, I have tinnitus all the time. And I cannot, and then, well, plus you add eight years of a canine barking in your, <laughs> right. in your ear. So yeah. when, that, when that hand cannon was shooting at you, I've never been shot at. Is it, is it a different sound? Like, cause it's, I mean, you're getting muzzle flash right towards you. I don't you even hear remember. the bullet whip, rip through the air? I don't remember the sound of his gun. I just remember the flash, the fire that came out of the barrel, because it was so dark that night, and yeah. there was no lighting back there at all. It and I and I immediately, I, I guess I dropped my flashlight, because I, I never saw him. I was just going by with the f every time I saw a flash. Wow. Yeah. Did you uh, go to sleep at all when you went home for that? No, dude. Oh, my God. I was, like, for 12 hours, I was just wired. Ramped up. Yeah. When that happens on, on your job, would they? Um, would you? How much time off would you get? We get some time to talk to someone, and uh, well, they mandatory give you three days, and then you have to get cleared by uh, a shrink. And you're probably like, oh, "What's the big deal? I'm fine." Well, I had all these. I had a. I had several of these occur like within a short amount of time. So I was at the point in my career. I'm thinking every day, every day, every day I go to work. It's like, oh my god, what's going to happen tonight? Yeah, that must. I mean. The, the adre adrenaline dumps yeah. involved in that. It's like running your body on nitro. Yeah, like. you kind of you kind of get addicted to it though at a certain point so you, because you, you you know with that and and then all the pursuits because I was really into stolen cars and I just I don't know I just got a, a kick out of that. Okay, chasing bad guys, not knowing what's going to happen, really doing stupid things. So you loved it. <laughs> yeah. So. After all those experiences and, and countless experiences we're, we haven't heard about, how do you feel like it affected you? I know we talked a little bit before about um, your girlfriend you're with now, and she's not in police work or anything. I mean, you at what point did you realize like this job, the negativity and constant bombardment of all those experiences made you kind of a different person than someone who goes to a nine-to-five job? Well, that's... And it's weird because when you're a cop, you generally only hang out with cops. Right. You know, and I don't know why, but it just seems to be that way. So you don't really notice how odd or different you are. Right. But as I got in this relationship with someone who has nothing to do with law enforcement and all her friends are just normal folks, no law enforcement, then you start to realize how odd you are. You just, you don't even think the same. Right, your mind just works differently. Yeah, and and you're just, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of sad in a way, you know. I think we we're so aware of everything all the time that we never get a chance to just relax. Right, and it gets to be overbearing. 
Yeah, yeah. Did they did they have at your work? Did they have um? All we ever have is like an eight hundred number on the wall. Well, um, you know, I ended up seeing um, a, a mental health lady after my wife passed away, and before I met Tammy. Um, you know, and, and you start to realize that all this stuff does take a toll. Yeah, it does physically. You know, and if you don't have a good outlet, it'll eat you up. Yeah, absolutely. Rob, what would you what would you say? What piece of advice could you offer to uh, a new candidate, a new recruit coming on the job as a police officer? Any piece of advice you'd give them? I think I would I would try to tell them to uh, first avoid the the cop diet that they all fall into, <laughs> right? Which you know you and I both know what that is, eating shitty food all the time. Um, but try to keep try to keep your friends around that are normal you know don't just exclude yourself with just cops and firemen or whatever that's good advice because it kind of keeps you i think it'll keep you a little more grounded and a little more um aware of of the real world because we're always dealing with the problems that sometimes these problems have been building up for years and years and years and we're expected to solve you know family issues that in five minutes but they've been occurring for 15 years right and and there's no i mean we're not trained for that you know you have to wear so many hats with this job it's just ridiculous absolutely so i would i would you know be careful just um understand what you're getting yourself into good stuff rob thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it you had some fantastic experiences you shared no worries. Anytime. Hey guys, thanks for checking out the podcast. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you did and you want to show some support for the show, please go to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.